Praise God. Wonderful. Great job, team. Thank you. All right. It is time to answer your demon questions <laughs> and related questions. I just want to say two things, and then we we'll take as much time, even the whole class, to answer questions. If not, we'll, we'll move on to another subject. And then each time I come in this semester, we'll be hitting on on different subjects that were on your list, staff leadership, and then going in the order that, that you were interested, we'll be we hitting on different things over the semester. So remember on the app, Esther Brown Ministries app, we've encouraged you to download, you can search for all kinds of stuff because we've got thousands of articles, thousands of videos, all kinds of links, so you'll find a lot of stuff you're looking for there, and that way you can take me home with you in your, in your pocket. Uh, okay, I was struck by something yesterday. So I've, I've been out of the country ministering probably about 200 different trips over the years. I've been to India 28 times, Italy 27 times, and many other countries many times. But I've, I've only been to Mexico eight times, uh, Peru twice, otherwise... Nowhere else in Latin America. Was in Spain once, but that was just to record some debates, the Christian TV that was located there. Portugal once, so even Brazilian speaking. So with, with all my overseas trips, for whatever reason, I just haven't been in Spanish-speaking world, Portuguese-speaking world that much. It's just an odd thing, because it's closer, right? You know, Latin America, Mexico, a lot closer than India or Singapore or Philippines or these other places. Uh, but I just wanted to say, being with you and then working out with, with so many Spanish speakers and things hanging around, it's just increased my desire to, to serve the Spanish-speaking and Portuguese-speaking world. So, I, so, you know, you just you feel that camaraderie and that, that greater burden. So I know we've got books out in some of those languages, but I just, it just kind of it hit me last night, just that greater connection. Because when you, when you go over... You go to a country for the first time and you see God move and, that, and, and you see people weep or get right with God or you just get drawn together, you know? So just spending the time, it's, it's, it has a good effect on me too. I wanted to let you know that. And um, do you have yet the book, Our Hands Are Stained With Blood? Okay, you, you will sometime this semester. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. Um, when, when I was asked to come and teach regularly, so at the Mercy Culture School Thursday, Friday, and then here Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday... And by the way, this morning before I came, I, I stopped over at the Upper Room School to s minister to them. So, um, great to see what God's doing in the region. But when I agreed to come here, there are key subjects, key themes that God's given me. There you go. Uh, key themes and subjects that, that God's given me over the years. And, and uh, I wanted to make sure that we made a deposit in, in all of you in these different ways. And so in the previous semesters, I kind of did a course, even though I'm in the guest speaker slot coming in once a month, but that could be a little harder to follow. You know, I come one month later and we resume. So we agreed we'll just do more different topics, you know, things of, that we can hit on like I do on my radio show every day. But uh, there are key things I wanted to make sure that you got a deposit from me. One is revival. And we talked about that. So everyone that comes through the school while I'm here, at some point you'll read revival or we die. And, and get that part of me. Um, the Jesus Revolution, we talked about last semester. At, at some point, if you're here, you'd be asked to read my revolution book. Our Hands Are Stained With Blood will make a deposit for you about Israel and the Jewish people. It's eye-opening, it's shocking, it's painful to read church history and how the church even persecuted the Jewish people. But God's eternal purpose is for Israel. And this school is deeply related to God's purposes for Israel. That's, that's part of the history and part of the legacy. So at a future time, I'll, I'll make reference to the, to the book, but just wanted to say that. And then I was asked a question about last night. Uh, so I started preaching before I started teaching. And people knew me around the world as Mike Brown, even though I had a PhD and all that, because I was just out preaching like I did last night. You know, simple messages and just pouring my heart out and seeing God move. And then when I got to Brownsville and the revival and led the school, everybody knew me as Dr. Brown. So I became Dr. Brown around the world, and people knew that side, but I cut my teeth preaching 
And the environment I love, I mean, I love to teach and pour in, but I just love to cut loose and see God move. And in your own lives, you know, there are different anointings that we function under. And, and there may be one anointing when you're dealing in this situation and another anointing in, in another. So there's a preaching anointing is different than teaching. For many people, it really varies. You may be very prophetic in one setting and very evangelistic in another. It's just how we flow in God. All right, with that, anyone that has any question that relates to the subject matter we, we covered the last two days, it can be personal as long as it relates to the subject matter. So not just a personal, I've got a Bible question I've been wondering about, or in my prayer life isn't good, but as any questions that you have, you can, this aisle like we normally do? Okay, you can line up in this aisle right over here, and surely some have questions. Okay, yeah, so just come around, and I'll get to as many questions. So as long as it relates to anything we've talked about in the last two days, go for it, and here we go. So if you don't mind, just for my benefit, just give me your first name and what country you're from, or what city in the States. Okay, great. You mentioned that, um, kind of touched on it, but not really got into it. Is fallen angel demons, or are they a different category? Yeah, certainly it seems that fallen angels are a different category than demons. We know for sure that fallen angels exist. The Bible references them. But I, I said at the outset that a lot of us just assume demons are fallen angels. But it doesn't seem to be what scripture says. So I don't know the origin of demons. They're different theories. But as far as we see, they're not fallen angels. So either way, they don't belong. So get them out of here in Jesus' name, right? <laughs> so hey, look, if you, if you came in your house and you saw somebody broken in your house, you're not going to ask, well, what country were you born in? What city did you come from? It's like, get out of my house. OK, yes, go ahead. Hello, my name is Briley Cloud. I am from the U.S., Oklahoma City. All right. Um, so my question uh, correlates with both what you talked about the last time you were here and like this time, the last two days. So there's a community of people that identify as animals. And honestly, people really just ignore them and make fun of them rather than addressing the problem. So my question is, how would we go about deliverance, like the obvious demon that's in them, like with that? Because people just ignore and make fun of them. And so, anyways. Got it. So... There, is, there are people, allegedly hundreds of thousands, who identify as furries. They, they can use other names as well, but furries is the common one. And they believe that they are part animal. You know, think back to Native American culture, and they say this person has the spirit of the wolf or the spirit of that. And so what I'm, I, I guess I mentioned it last semester that uh, on, on most of our smart watches now, like I can see what my, my heart rate is. So the, the gentleman who invented the, the technology for heart, uh, heart monitors on smart watches is you know, brilliant guy, Stanford, MIT, trained, that kind of thing, professor. But for over 20 years, he has identified as a cheetah named Spotticus. Yeah, so this, there are actually these gatherings where people get together, they wear animal costumes, they'll howl, they'll do different, and, and this is who they really are. And when you read their stories, it sounds very much like a gay kid. I, I didn't fit in with the other guys, there was always something different about me, and then I found my real identity. So as bizarre as it seems, it's out there. I mean, I, I wrote about it a good number of years ago, and I was shocked to learn. I mean, there are others that feel they're part alien and things, but e either way, and, and then there's even been a debate in the transgender community because trans people say, no, this is who I really am, and my, my, I really have like a male brain and a female body, but they can't say that this person has like a cheetah brain or a chimpanzee brain or a dog brain, so they have to say it's mental and emotional. So here's the thing. You don't know necessarily that it's a demon. It could be, but like think of any sin whether it's porn addiction, whether it's fierce, angry, violent temper, whatever the sin is, whether it's gluttony, laziness, anything could come under demonic power. Demons can be involved in anything, and if we open ourselves a certain way or do something enough or in the wrong environment, we could come under demonic power, which makes the thing even worse. But you can't tell necessarily by the sin 
that it, it's demonically related. So if I was ministering to someone like this, I would treat it like everything else. It could just be immature fantasy. It could be some deep emotional wound from growing up. Uh, it, it could be they open themselves up to demonic forces. So the thing is you take a personal interest in the person. You, you, you can't laugh at them and mock them, right? I mean, I'm going to speak of the insanity of the thing itself while trying to generate compassion for the people. So it's like anyone else. You take a genuine interest. You let them tell you your story. You fight you're know, reacting and laughing or being sarcastic because that's real world to them. And then get to the root of it. And, and ask God for discernment. Uh, I, I remember hearing one healing minister say that he ministered to two consecutive people over a short period of time with epilepsy, and one was due to scars on the brain, so it was, it was a physical condition, and he prayed and the person was healed, and the other, it was, a, it was a demonic spirit. So there was nothing physically evident, but it was a demonic spirit. So we need discernment the same way. Never make the assumption that, that someone is under specific demonic power and needs deliverance. But the Lord may show you immediately. In fact, it wouldn't surprise me if in days to come we're ministering and, and you, the next thing you get some image of some animal. It's like, what is this? And as weird as it seems, you might ask the person, you know, if you've got a good track record. I don't mean the first time trying. Excuse me, sir, does uh, baboons mean anything to you? <laughs> you know, you don't just... But if you've got a good track record... It may come up, you know, and suddenly, hey, does that mean anything to you? I, I, and, and it's like, yeah, that's, that's my identity. That's my inner being. And then God gives discernment as to how to minister. So there's no one size fits all except compassion and the power of the spirit. You have those, you're in good, you're in good ground. Thanks. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. My name is Tyler Owens. I'm from Fresno, California. Um, all right. So my, my question is, um, so you kind of mentioned, like, how we shouldn't, like, seek out, like, looking for demons and stuff like that. Um, so my question is, do you believe, like, if the church was able to, like, fully see in the spirit realm and, and fully see everything that was going on, would we be surprised of how many things are actually demonic or how many things are actually not demonic? I think it's probably both. In, in other words, we may make a lot of assumptions that something is demonic when it isn't. But I, I would suspect we would see a lot more demonic activity than we realize. That if we had more discernment in the spiritual realm. I remember praying for it years ago, just wanting to, like, I wanted to see with my eyes in the spiritual realm, like the natural, and God never gave me that. But on the one hand, yes, there's certain things we'd be sure this person's demonized and it's just fleshly. But probably much more, we would see demonic activity, darkness, more than we realize. And a lot of things that seem kind of innocent are, are probably worse than we realize. It probably affect the way a lot of us live that if we're casual about holiness and casual about standards, we, we'd probably live differently if we could see more in the spiritual realm. So I think more so than not, we'd be surprised by how much demonic activity is going on. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so in that case, do you think the church should emphasize more of, you know, talking about that type of stuff, doing deliverance and talking about demons? I think we should talk about it as much as the New Testament does. In other words, to the degree it's emphasized in the New Testament and, and, and in the letters and that, that Satan's mentioned, spiritual warfare is mentioned, we should be that aware, but we shouldn't overemphasize it. The key thing is, if we ourselves are more full of the Spirit, if we ourselves are walking more in the light, then the darkness will be exposed more readily. And, and so that would be my answer. And it depends. Some churches overemphasize it. I would say most underemphasize it. Uh, but you don't, you don't want to swing from one extreme to another. So you just, okay, let's just preach through Scripture. Let's just go through the Word, and as these things come up, they come up. And then, then we sometimes do a greater focus on it, realize, okay, we're imbalanced here. We've got to shore this up. But, you know, I've said for many years, my great concern in America is not the presence of darkness. It's the absence of light. And, and when I see the light shining, I know the darkness is going to be confronted. It's just going to happen. So, for example, when... We were having pro-life Supreme Court justices appointed. And now it's the, the, the battle for the second one in Brett Kavanaugh. You literally had protesters scratching at the doors of the Supreme Court, screaming and scratching at the doors. You didn't have to look for them. When, when, when that righteousness rose, it comes up. So that's the biggest thing. Be aware and then be really filled with God. And as we are, light will shine. We'll see things. Yep, thanks.
Yes, sir. Chad Watson from Dallas, Texas. Um, <laughs> my main question is, uh, what age should we be able to teach like students um, about spiritual warfare? Like, around what age? I'm a youth leader, so it, it's very important for my students to actually know but not be scared of that. Right. So I'm, I'm not an expert on children's ministry, but there are general principles to the degree that parents can talk to, a, to their child about there's a real devil or there are real demons, that's when it's appropriate to teach on it. Uh, otherwise, you, 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 know, you don't want them so devil conscious that they grow up scared in, in that regard. But they do have to understand there's good and there's evil, and there are good people and there are bad people, and then there's God and there's the devil. So it's a matter of introducing them in a way that's healthy and practical. That's really the bottom line. What will help them live for God today? And, and if they just know, okay, there's a devil and he's, he's really bad and he's got like an army of bad, bad guys and they're, they're trying to hurt you. So if they can understand, okay, if I step in this realm over here, if I'm listening to the satanic rock music or some sensual lyrics and hip hop or, or watching some movies just with gratuitous violence and sex, you're stepping over into the dark side. And that's really what makes you vulnerable. The devil can really attack you and harass you. Maybe you're tormented and depressed and cutting yourself. Where you, this side is going to get worse. So whatever you do, make it practical. You don't just want to make it abstract. You know, there's the spiritual realm and there's demons and angels. And so th wherever they are, the more practical you make it, then you can give the background to it. You can, get, you, you can give more of that. But if you start with the background, then they can focus on that. Focus on the reality and how it affects their lives, and then say, hey, there's stuff behind the scenes. And every age group, you know, there's different maturity with different ones. But make it practical. So you teach through spiritual warfare and the existence of, of demons and angels and so on. And then, okay, how does this work out in our lives? What does it mean in our lives? So, and then I'm sure you'll have wisdom from there. Thanks. Shalom, Ani Eliana, Vani Mi Israel. All right. Good, Hi, good. I'm Eliana, and I'm from Israel. Um, <laughs> so my question is: So you talk about how there's a there's sometimes like a difference between it being demonic, like it's not always demonic. It can sometimes be physical or emotional. Right. So I'm specifically curious with physical but also emotional. How can you tell the difference? How can you tell if it's a demon or if it's not? Right, so first thing is, there's no set rule. In other words, it's, it's not like, okay, when you lay your hands on a person, if it's physical, your hand will turn red. If it's demonic, it'll turn purple. Or, you know, you feel the quiver here or the shake there. So there's no method. And if anyone gives you a method, don't believe it. Even if it's for them, even if it's how God shows them, it, it's not for everybody. So that's where we... We ask God for discernment if, if we're praying and nothing's happening. But my first thing is whatever this is, is physical, in other words, this, this person has a physical disease that's killing them, or this person is, the, the whole root of this thing is a, is a demonic attack, you know, crippled by a spirit like the woman in Luke 13. I'm not even trying to figure that out. I know it's something intrusive that doesn't belong. So I'm just going to say, get out, leave in Jesus' name, whether I'm speaking to a sickness whether I'm speaking to a demon, that, that's my mindset, especially if you're praying for hundreds of people, right? It's just leave, get out. What are you speaking? Well, whatever is there that doesn't belong by the authority of Jesus, we're driving out. So to me, it's, it's simple in that regard. If I'm praying and ministering to the person and we're hitting a wall and, and something's not yielding, then you pray, more, okay, what's going on? Father, is there something else happening here? Look, there are people that you're praying, driving out demons and rebuking Satan and praying for a miracle, and the person just is, is, has a lifestyle habit that's hurting them. Like I, I, the guy that called me from the hospital the other day in agony, asking me to pray, he concluded that the problem was that he was in physical agony because his whole system was stopped up because of a painkiller he was taking. And when he stopped the painkiller, the thing went away. So here we are praying and crying out and what we needed to do was make a little change there. So sometimes you don't, you know, you don't know. So that's where you have to dig deeper. Just like if you're, 
you're ministering to someone that's got some stronghold in their lives and they can't seem to, to overcome. It's like, well, let's get to the root of it. Maybe there's some history here. Maybe, and then you go back and you find, wow, it even goes back to childhood issues and they, they get healed emotionally and the next thing they're set free. So to me, I'm just going after this thing. Someone says, I'm suffering with this condition. I'm just saying, God touch them in Jesus' name or if I feel the authority of God. We command healing. We command freedom. And also think every healing is a deliverance of sickness. And every deliverance is a healing of a wrong condition. So as long as I come in the authority of Jesus, I don't necessarily have to figure out what it is. But if it stays, then you try to get insight. Okay, why, why is it still here? What's standing in the way? Make sense? Okay, thanks. My name is Daniel. And I'm from Colombia. And my question... <laughs> So my question is, uh, I'd like to know what are your thoughts on soul ties. You on know, what? Soul ties. Uh-huh. Especially when it has to do, for example, when a person has sex with somebody else or when somebody has been sexually abused, and uh, they, they talk that it creates a soul tie, like a connection with the person. Yeah. Okay. And then how that ties in with demonic. So soul ties, right? Soul ties are very real. And if you ever had them, you, you get a connection with someone an emotional connection that you shouldn't have, they can be very, very hard to break, especially when you, you open a door wrongly. So I've, you know, I've ministered to people, maybe a married man who's got a soul tie with a woman he's just gotten too friendly with, and he's fighting feverishly to break it, and his thing is, they can be very, very strong. So first, there is the power of the thing in our souls, and it can just be that sometimes, if, if they will break the tie if they will cut off all communication and repent before God, they're free. But with anything, this is what I was saying before, once you cross a line, once you open a door, you now open yourself for demonic activity. And there are times now where that person can't get set free without deliverance. So the thing itself is powerful enough, but if the doors, the wrong doors are open or the enemy has a, a way in, he's now going to add to that. He's going to make it more intense and this way, the person is even more tormented. I'm trying. I'm repenting. I repented day and night. I can't get set free. I'm trying to break this thing. I keep getting pulled back in. And, and they seem powerless. That's when it would seem they need deliverance. So sometimes deep, sweeping repentance clears the whole thing out. And people weep before God under conviction. And they're free. They walk away free. And other times they do that. And they're still hitting the wall. They're still hitting the wall. So again, it's that same thing. You're not looking for a demon or assuming it's there, but when, when there's this extra stronghold that won't yield or the person's under torment or the Lord reveals what's going on, that's when you, you break its power. That being said, if the person's not willing to repent, you can rebuke demons all day long. And it's not going to do anything. They may get a little relief, but they're still going to go back. But if, it's, and if you've ever had that in your life, it's like I've, I've done everything I know how to do before God and pledged my life, and this thing is still here, well, it could well be demonic then. And that's when you get some help. Hey, I, I need to be set free. Does, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. I thought I was going to hold it. Uh, yeah, I'm Miguel Ponce from Arlington, Texas. And, um, yeah, my question is basically uh, with pride. And um, there's, like, a saying that goes around, like, you know, deliverance is for the desperate. And uh, I was uh, just wondering how, like, pride... Like, like, I heard some ministers, like, say that pride can really hinder deliverance and that almost like, like, there's this one minister that basically he was, like, encouraging the body to, like, like, oh, if you feel like screaming, then scream, like, you know, like, almost like encouraging, like, certain, like, expressions of, like, how to, like, you know, let things go for us right. because, like, Usually, like, he would say that, oh, yeah, pride can, like, make people, like, self-conscious about themselves and not really want to, like, like, let the thing out almost, you know, because they're like, oh, what if the person, like, next to me thinks, like, so I just wanted you to, like, expand yeah. on that a little. So pride can, can always get in the way of us getting set free. If there's an altar call, well, if I go up, what are people going to think? If God really touches me, am I going to weep? What are people going to think? Um, if the Holy Spirit, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, I begin to speak out, what are they going to think? So pride can get in the way of everything. Uh, I've always said that the number one sin I had to deal with in getting saved was, was not my, my drug addictions, it was pride. I'm going to say that I was, I was wrong. So that's always an issue, and it can be here too. 
you know, for example, for example, um, do you want to admit I'm I'm under demonic influence? Do, do I, you know, do I do I really want to say that, or is that does that mean that I'm not really a man of God or a woman of God, or there's something wrong with me? So, pride can get in the way of everything, and in general, if you're conducting like a mass deliverance, you might just want to say, hey, if if God's setting you free or if something's leaving, just let it happen. But you don't want to suggest things. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to put it in someone's mind that you're going to scream or you're going to do this or you're going to do that. But look, just like ideally, if you're praying for someone to be baptized in the Spirit, you don't want to coach them. You don't want to say, now if you feel something, just go ahead and speak. You just want the Holy Spirit to fall on them, the power of God to touch them. Next thing, they're speaking in tongues. But many people have preconceptions. Right, that God is going to take over their mouths. So there's something like, it's like, well, nothing's happening. Okay, well, just begin to praise, begin to open your mouth. So sometimes you have to tell people, not to coach them, but because they're, they've got these preconceptions that are holding back. So maybe someone with a good spirit wants to help someone saying, hey, if you need to be set free, then you be set free. And if that means screaming, shouting, falling, just... Let God work, and if there's something in you that doesn't belong there, let it go. But you don't want to suggest this may happen, this may happen, and put that in people's heads. But it's like anything else. Pride could get in the way. Even to say, I need deliverance. Well, you're a pastor. You're, you're a leader. You're, you're a woman of God. You're a, you're a prayer warrior. You, know, you don't even want to say it, but it, it can happen. It can happen in any of our lives where the enemy gets a foothold. So I, th- I think it's a factor. We just be careful that we don't tell people, expect this, or here's the, the, the vomit bag if you're going to throw up. It's just, if it happens, it happens, you know, but you start suggesting it, it'll happen more than real. Yeah, because people can get worked up. You know, and, and uh, by the way, I've seen people all worked up. It's like, just calm down, calm down. It's like, well, I don't have to get worked up. No, no, just calm down. How many people have you prayed for to be filled with the Spirit? It's like, just, just receive, just receive. So you don't want to work people up emotionally, but by all means, humble yourself and let God move. And if you get set free in some unexpected way, so be it. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I was just going to say, yeah, go ahead. personally, uh, like, yeah, just stop. Oh, you, can, you, can. Uh, you, can, you can personally stop the demon from coming out of you, like, because of what you think. If that, you yeah, know, if, someone... you're, if you're, like anything, we still have a will, mm-hmm. Right. And if I'm more concerned with what people think, or if I, I just, you know, I, I, I don't want to get delivered at that cost, we could stop anything. Here, if, if we can quench the spirit, we could stop deliverance. We could stop demonic things. But again, I, I, don't, I think sometimes we think too much about it. And it's better just, just let God move. And if you realize, hey, is God, you feel something going on in your life, just, just let go. And let God do what he does doesn't mean stop thinking. It just means don't resist. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, h- hello there. My name is John. And I do believe I'm from Chattanooga, Tennessee, I believe. Okay. All right, I'm going to make this real quick. And this is really more like more into the charismatic uh, circle in general. Like, I'm not trying to sound mean-spirited or biting or anything, but so my question is, how can someone who's uh, theologically and politically charismatic not mistake someone who's autistic, or at least in the autism spectrum, as demonic ties, when really they're just born differently than everyone else? Like, how, can you, how can people here like, discern if they're either being demonically possessed, or at least they're being born in a different way, like autistically or in like a autism spectrum? Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, It's the same as everything else, the discernment of the spirit. In in other words, there are people born with certain conditions, uh, and it's totally natural. There are people born with certain conditions, and it's demonic. There, There are people that commit certain sins, and it's just the power of the flesh, and there are others that that they become fully demonized. So it's like anything else. Um, you know, we, 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 if, if something is a condition that we consider it to be a, a, a hurt or a handicap or a problem or issue, we pray for healing, we pray for mercy. There, look, what if someone's under a curse? What if there's a line of family curses? You start looking in the Bible about it, and I've read books about blessing and cursing, but they're really rich, full of scripture, but then it's the end, it's like, 
is everything a curse? Is everything, and you can't even figure it out. You're always trying to get back to some, trace it back like 30 generations and there's some curse passed down for our family. And it, it, gets, it gets maddening. Instead of living for God today, you're trying to, constantly trying to figure it out. So in a case like yours, you know, we, we bless everyone, welcome everyone, all, all with our idiosyncrasies and strengths and weaknesses. But if there's something oppressive, if there's something that's hindering and, and, and destructive, then we try to get to the root of it. But it's the same as anything else. There's, there's no assumption. You can't just say, well, this is always this and this is always that. And I know there are people with healing ministries and delivering ministries that put things in categories, that this case is always this, this case is always this. Maybe they know better than I do, and I mean that sincerely. But I, I just don't see everything put in categories. That's why there's sick people who are sick who are healed. Here, so in, in one case, Jesus pronounces someone healed. Another case, he lays hands on someone. Another case, he drives out demons, each one being different. He didn't drive a demon out of the man born blind, right? And, and then there are others, he drove demons out, and then they could speak or they could see. So each case is different and unique. Yes. Hey, my name is Serenity Hostetter, and I'm from Conover, North Carolina. And there's some people back up. Hey, home. can I ask just out of uh -huh. curiosity, what do your parents say when you were a baby? Were you, were you calm and quiet? Because you get a name like Serenity. <laughs> you know, like if you were like a little terror and things running around the house, it's kind of. <laughs> so for parents thinking about naming kids, does it work? You know, when they. I guess. Yeah, okay. Because you seem to have a very peaceful personality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So parents having a kid, just name calm, <laughs> obedient. What's your name? Obedient. <laughs> Joy, joyful. Go ahead. But there's some people back at home that I used to work with and like friends I used to have. And I could see like they had this demonic oppression over them. And I could see that some of them were like struggling with demons. And I was wondering, do you have any suggestions on like how to handle that? Because... Right, so the key thing is to do your best to attract them to Jesus and for them to recognize their need for the Lord. If they start there, you can lead them to the Lord and by the power of the Spirit, take authority over, over those demonic powers. If you felt insecure doing it, just get someone else with you. But once they acknowledge their need and want God to come into their lives, then we can minister to them because otherwise... It's only going to get worse. But if they don't want God, let's just say we had the power to drive spirits out of them. Let's say they were demonized, quote, demon-possessed, you know, wherever you want to draw that line. And you could drive the spirit out of them. If they haven't surrendered to God, if they're not right with God, it's only going to get worse for them. There are, there are people with experience in deliverance ministry that will never minister deliverance to a child unless the parents are there and the parents are believers. Uh, just a quick story. There was a, a kid in the mid-'80s when I was ministering in upstate New York, and I remember when I first met him, there was this old TV show, Dennis the Menace, the kind of scruffy-haired, blonde hair. And just, the kid looked like him, and, but he had these really pronounced cross eyes. He put glasses on, he would look normal, but, I mean, really, really pronounced cross eyes. And his, parent, his mother was a, not a believer. She was a mocker. So we prayed for him in one meeting, and he was instantly healed. His eyes got normal. And he was, he was in the back of the, the building. And, and I asked him, you know, can you see perfectly without his glasses? And you could see his eyes went normal. It was in front of your eyes, miracle. And he went home to tell his mother, all excited and rejoicing. And the pastor told me afterwards, and she kept mocking, and God doesn't heal, and you're not healed. And after a while, eyes went back the way they were. It was just like heartbreaking. Oh, come on. So the, the person has to have that heart to yield. But if they do, then you say, look, you're under oppression, and Jesus is going to set you free. He's going to forgive your sins, and he's going to set you free, and just make it one package deal, you know, and then use the authority of Jesus to, to minister deliverance to them. Absolutely. Yep, thanks. Hi, I'm Jonah. I'm from uh, Minnesota. All right. And um, in the story that you told a couple days ago about the uh, hitchhiker, yeah. right, you said he had like seven demons or some number yeah, like yeah. that, and... Uh, that after he was delivered, he was shocked because he didn't even know he had a problem with that. Well, he knew he, was, he had alcohol, drug problems. Right. 
and depression and all that. But no, he didn't know he it was demonic. He didn't know it was demonic, no, right. No clue. So my question is, can a person know if they're demon-possessed? Because like even in the Bible, you read about one person bringing another person and saying they have a demon. But you don't read about somebody coming to Jesus and saying, I have a demon. Well, the, right. if you think the Gadarene demoniac in Mark 5, he comes running to Jesus, mm. but then the demon speaks through him, what do, you want, what do you want with us? But the man comes running, yeah. right? So that's, that's his desperation. Oh, yeah, there are definitely people that know. They're, they're on the wrong side. They've crossed over to the dark side. Um, they know they need deliverance. Maybe they were raised in the faith, and they know, or they're just aware. They're tormented. Look, there are people that really experience unusual demonic things where they know they're getting attacked or they're getting harassed or the, the night terrors or whatever it is, or they feel physical stuff. So plenty of people know mm -hmm. and, and know they need help. But again, the help has to be coming to Jesus, not just getting rid of the oppression. Because, you know, you know it's like if, if you grew up in abject poverty and I'm a super wealthy, sharp businessman who can con people, if, if you inherited a million dollars the next day and you never had money, I'll get it from you. I'll figure out how to get it, and you'll be just as poor because you never had it. You're not, so the same way, if you're not walking in freedom and obedience, you get set free, you're just going to end up in a worse situation. But sure, there are people who would know. Let me just ask this. How many of you, before you were saved, were very conscious that, that you were under demonic oppression or demonic power? Yeah, and so, I mean, it's, it's going to be the norm. And some people may wrongly think they are, and it's just they're going through a rough patch in life. But many do know they're tormented and under demonic power, either because of an outward attack they experience or just that inner torment, or they can't, can't change, can't change, can't change, and are desperate. So for sure, they're there. Absolutely. Yes. Hello. My name is Susie, and I'm from Israel. Um, hey. Yeah. Let me know. Yeah. And um, I wanted to ask a question from the Bible, actually. Um, so in the story of Peter, um, in Matthew, you know, 16, it talks about how Jesus uh, rebuked him and told him, um, basically called him Satan. Yeah, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and said, get behind me, Satan. And that was after um, it says that Peter got, you know, the power of the Holy Spirit to heal, to cast out demons, all of that. And also in the same chapter, it talks about even how he called him to be Peter, basically. Um, so my question is, like, what is your opinion about um, his condition at that time? Was he um, demonized? Was he under demonic um, influence or whatever? I just think in that case that he became a mouthpiece for Satan. Okay. See, later in the Gospels, it tells us that Judas, that, that Satan entered Judas Iscariot. Mm -hmm. That's a whole different thing. And he's called the son of perdition. In other words, the one doomed to destruction. Right, so you know the Hebrew idiom, you know, so the son of, right? One doomed to destruction. Uh, with Peter, because a moment before, right, Matthew 16, Mark 8, yeah. Luke 9, parallel passage, blessed are you, Simon Peter, Simon son of Jonah, or excuse me, Simon son of Jonah, for flesh and blood is not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven, and you are Peter. So he says these wonderful things to him. Yeah. And then when he says, I'm going to the cross, and Peter says, never, you're never going. Get behind me, Satan. If you don't have in mind the things of God, but the things of me, you're a stumbling block to me. So that was really, he became a mouthpiece for Satan. I don't look at it that he was demon-possessed at that moment or that Satan took, over his, took control of his mouth, but his sentiments, his worldly viewpoint, his anti-cross mentality was straight from the pit. And therefore, it was, it was as if Satan was speaking through him. He, he became a mouthpiece for Satan, not by bodily possession, but by attitude and speech. And that's why Jesus rebuked Satan there. Yeah, thanks. Hello, my name is Deja. I'm from Arlington, Texas. Hi. <laughs> um, my question was more so about like items. Like I know how you shared the story of like, oh, it's just set. a cool chess set. Yeah. Um, but I know like that demons can come in through like a right of certain items. So like, is it some things can just be like a crystal can just be a crystal or like I know a lot of people are into that for like more witchcrafty purposes, the same thing as like jewelry with like the evil eye, sage, stuff like that. Does that allow demons to come in 
or if like somebody unknowingly has something that will also allow like a right to the demons. Got it. So let me, let me break it down on a few things. Obviously, a crystal in and of itself is a crystal. But it could be used for demonic purposes. And it could be that it was set apart and sanctified for demonic, you know, demonic sanctification set apart for and curses spoken over it. And it has some power. It could be. And again, you don't go on witch hunts with that. But if there's something going on, and there are real cases like that, where there is some, something's wrong. We keep getting sick. It's, just, it's been the last three months and since, since I came back from that trip to so-and-so. And then, well, did you bring anything back? And it's like, well, yeah, this one thing. And it's like, you want to know what that is? That's this witchcraft item. And, it's, and you get rid of it, and, and everything's fine. So that can't happen. It's real. But again, let the Holy Spirit reveal it as, part, as opposed to going constantly on a witch hunt, always looking, trying to figure the thing out. It'll drive you crazy. The second thing is, there are things that in our own lives have become uh, fertile ground for the enemy. Like, let's say, for example, uh, you were in a, a very intense sinful relationship, and, and you know, the, you're know you with some guy, and he gave you this ring. It's just a ring. He didn't speak curses over it, anything, but you didn't want to throw the ring out. It's a nice ring. No, that's your attachment. That's your connection to that person still, right? Or that old picture. That you, just, you don't want to get rid of it, but that keeps connecting you. That keeps the thing open. So that could be a gateway to demonic things. So, you know, so those are the, the different elements. Um, and, and certain things, like I mentioned, the guy, the witches were going to curse his pies. He said, well, make them apple pies because I like apple pie or pumpkin pie. You know, your curse has no power over me. So that's how we should live. There's an interesting verse in Proverbs 26 that says the, the curse without cause shall not come to light. In other words, it won't, it won't land on someone. There's, a, another, there's another way to read the Hebrew, which the curse without cause will, will come back on the one who sent it. So we walk in a mentality of we're blessed in God, therefore we can't be cursed. But sometimes there are things where a door can be opened or there can be something. And if, if the thing itself has clear satanic or demonic association, then, then we don't want it around just for that reason. Just like you wouldn't have a naked picture around for that, the thing itself is wrong. But there are other things that are neutral in themselves, but they may have been used for demonic purposes. And therefore, if, if God draws our attention to it, we get rid of it. And then things that bring up, open the door to us to demonic things, by all means, we get rid of those. Yeah, thanks. I'm Samuel, I'm from Brazil. I want to make a question into the story of Matthew chapter 8 when God was with a man with the legend of, of demons. And I want to understand the part of that story because when Jesus was casting out that demons, the demons asked Jesus to allow them to go to the, the pigs. But it's funny because when the legend of demons was in the guy, he was just like suffering, cutting, cutting himself, but he was not dying. But when the legend of, uh, legion of demons went to the pigs, they automatically died. So I want to ask if demons, they, they have power to kill humans. And if they have, uh, why they don't kill the guy? Right, so we, we don't know exactly why demons do what they do. And, and you would think normally they don't want to drive someone to death because that's their home. But certainly people are driven demonically to commit suicide. There's no question that that people commit horrific acts and then commit suicide, and it's, it's some of it, in some cases, it's, it's demonic, Satan behind it. But to me, the difference between the human being and the pigs is just that, that a human being has a will and is created in the image of God, even if fallen, whereas the pigs are not. So whereas the human being could in some way fight or hold on uh, and resist and, and maybe be in torment but still have a will enough to run to Jesus needing help, but he can't get himself free. The pigs can't do that. So, you know, it's, it's just like if, if um, you know, think of it, if it's, if it's a truck smashing up against this wall, it's going to go right through that wall. But if it's a bicycle smashing against it, it's going to have a different effect. So you reverse it. You know, those demons and the pigs, instant destruction. And that's not where they, they want to be. That's their way of demonstrating how many they were. That's why Jesus does it. But a human being still has a will. 
And that's why there seemed to be a battle. So he was in severe torment, but still was, didn't kill himself, whereas the pigs instantly did. So the difference between a human and a pig. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry. Um, hello, my name is Kwe, and I'm from Indonesia. Um, sir, so I need you to clarify uh, this passage in Luke uh, chapter 11. As we can see, there's a story between Jesus and Beelzebul where he cast out the demon out of the crowd, but some of the crowd then say, by the power of Beelzebul, the rule of demons, he cast out demons. And then the, Jesus replied, so if Satan too is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Right? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. But the fact is, uh, in my home country back then, I witnessed like quite a lot, like, well, some cases where people are demon possessed, but then they go to a salmon, you know, and the salmon, uh, you know, doing this whole ritual and they cast out the demons out of the body. So my question is, how can they have the authority to cast out demon while they are associated with demon itself? Right, so a great question. And by the way, every question is a great question and, and each one different, I, I appreciate it. And, and I'm not some expert in, this is not my main ministry, Demons Deliverance, just you know, studied the word and had ministry experience, certain things are self-evident. So what happens is they get set free from one thing but get something worse that they may get delivered from one bondage, but Satan takes control in another area of their life. It's almost like you make a deal with the devil, like, hey, help me out here, but you're gonna pay there. So they will never be completely free the way they would be in Jesus' name. It's more just the enemies adding to the deception. Uh, one of my colleagues ministered in, in, among the Mexican Indians and in very heavy witch doctor demon culture, and, and he, he would see that happen. The witch doctor would set somebody free, but they always got something worse in the process. So they get physically healed, but now they come under severe demonic attack in this area. Or, or now they get bound by this sin or something. So it's, it's never going to be real freedom. It's just going to be an illusion that one thing's leaving, but something worse is going to come in in the process. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. My name is Precious from Nigeria. Uh, yeah. Yeah, thank what? You. We don't have enough thank names you. like that in America. Uh, we have many right? Nigerians here, yeah. And how, how can you name a kid Precious and the kid ends up a rebel? Right? Precious. Right? Thank you. Yeah, yeah my question is about uh, spirit spouse. Spirit spouse or spirit husband and spirit okay. wife. You know? So I want to know your opinion about spirit spouse. If it's real, how can one know? Uh, he so, or she. Right, define what you understand spirit spouse okay, to mean. Okay, spirit spouse is... Uh, yeah, a demon, some, a human being having a marital affair with a spirit being. That doesn't, you know... Okay, yeah, so, so... If there's a whole teaching on it, and a whole doctrine of it, and a whole ministry based on it, I would run from it, okay? You would run from it? I would run from, like, this, it's the whole ministry is based on this, or this is what they go around identifying, because if this happens, it's unbelievably infrequent, and it's, it's nothing to major on or go looking for. Otherwise, it's going to open up people's minds to all kinds of demonic deception and fantasy. So is it possible that someone has an affair with a demon and... Well, anything is possible. I mean, in, in that regard, you could do anything with a demon in the fantasy realm. You could go to Mars with a demon. You could rob banks with a demon. I mean, you could fantasize anything, and the demons will enter into it. But the fact, the idea that there is a literal thing that goes on, and you can identify you have a spirit spouse, I, I would not go near that as a teaching or doctrine. If some bizarre thing is revealed, and it becomes clear that you gave yourself over to fantasy... And, and you ended up, you know, having this fantasy lover and it would come to you and something. And all right, so that's another bizarre demonic thing that people open themselves up. You could open yourself up to anything. But to make a doctrine of it, I don't see a hint in scripture about it. 
I've been in ministry 51, well, 50 years and never once run into, run into that, run into a whole lot of other things, but never ran into that. So if someone makes it a major point, big doctrine, I would just be very skeptical. This is my honest answer. Maybe somebody knows more than me about it, but that's... Okay, uh, okay. I want to throw more light to this. Like, uh, there have been several situations where people have been delivered during the course of a, a deliverance programs, mm -hmm. and demons refuse to go, claiming that, oh, I, I married her. That's a lie. I demons am married. lie. Okay, I'm... I'm never, okay. never, ever, ever base doctrine on what demons say. Don't. They may say, Jesus is Lord, we know it. Okay, we don't need you to say that. We know that. We don't need your testimony that he's Lord. Uh, so that's where people make mistakes when they draw doctrines from what demons say. Demons love to get us on all kinds of wild goose chases. So I guarantee you if somebody's in an affair, they're in an affair with that human being. They're attracted to that human being and drawn to that human being or having sex with that human being. And if there's a demon behind it, they don't know that. You know, and that's, you break the tie with that human being, that's the key thing. So I just would not, let demons say what they say, ignore them, tell them, shut up and leave. Okay. All right? Thank Thanks. <laughs> just, okay, yes. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm from uh, Dallas, Texas, uh, Rockwall area. Okay. But um, I, I have a really simple question. It's pretty much just yes or no. Um, does a person have to manifest in order for you to deliver them from said demon? No. No, they don't have to manifest. There could be, there could be something that you discern as demonic, and you minister, and then they have freedom. There could be something as you're ministering, they get delivered, and there was nothing outward. Right, every, every case was, was different. For example, the, the man that was, was blind and mute Jesus drives the spirit out, and he can talk and see. Doesn't say he shook, doesn't say he fell. The, the boy in, in, in Mark 9, Luke 9, and, and Matthew 17, he convulses and screams and, when the demon leaves. So every, and, and he was convulsing before as a manifestation. So no, it's, it's not always going to be the same. And sometimes if that's what we're always looking for, the devil will be there to put on a show. You can minister to some people, and they'll put on a show over and over and over, and you realize after the 20th time, it's like you're just into doing this, you know? Or we're giving a platform to the enemy. So, no, there, there may be no physical outward manifestation in that regard, but you discern something, and the person confirms it, uh, and they may get set free without an outward display. So it's, it's all different. Just like people are touched by God, and everyone's different the way they respond, Right? So, yeah, there's not always going to be an outward manifestation of the condition or of the deliverance. Thank you. Yeah, let the fruit, let the fruit be the test. All right, tell you what, because it's 1159, um, why don't we bless everyone. And the last three here, I'll answer you. Then, then i got to run because i got to pack up, do radio, and then head over to Fort Worth. You're supposed to, like, yeah, Fort Worth. Okay. <laughs> and anyway... Remember to use the app and search for all kinds of questions there. We've got lots of answers and material. And then we will be back with you, God willing, in one month for the next juicy topic that you want to talk about. God bless. Great being with you. Thanks. <laughs>